It's blessings to the reading of his word. The miracle of feeding of the 5,000 is the only miracle, by the way, that is totally covered by all four gospel writers. No other miracle is covered by all four like this one. This is the only one that is covered by the four gospel writers. Of all the wonderful works that Jesus did, none was so great and so public as this. None was performed before more people than this miracle alone. This miracle sets forth a marvelous truth. And I want you to write this down if you're taking notes. This miracle sets forth the person of Christ, the bread of life. The bread of life. It declares him in glowing terms. I want to point out something to you. First of all, look in verse 1. The Bible says, after these things. When you come across a statement like this, therefore... And after these things, you need to be inquisitive enough to discover what he's talking about. After these things. After what things? The healing of the impotent man here in John's gospel. The persecution of the Jews. The determination to kill Jesus, the son of the living God. And so Jesus left those who hated him and rejected him and look where he goes. The Bible says he went up on a mountain and there met with his disciples. He withdrew himself from those who rejected him. Now think with me for just a moment how serious that is. That is a, that is a serious statement. He left those who rejected him, those who sought to kill him, those who criticized his ministry. He withdrew to the mountains with his disciples. That's a serious warning this morning, beloved, to all who are lost outside of Jesus Christ. It is a serious thing to reject the Son of the living God. After these things, after these things. You will note again and again throughout all the Gospels that Jesus would go into a certain village or town or city. And if they did not receive him, he would leave. Jesus never forces himself upon anyone. Jesus makes himself available to everyone. Can you say amen? amen. Jesus loves the little children of the world. They are precious in his sight. He loves everyone. But he will not. He will not force his love on anyone. And so when people reject him, he has no other alternative just but to walk, turn and walk away and walk away. Look at verse 5 in this passage. The great multitudes, the miracles drew many after Jesus, but few to him. Oh, the crowds were thrown after him because they heard about the miracles that he performed. Here in this Gospel of John, in this very text, which is the core of all of that which Jesus was doing at this time in the early stages of his ministry, the, these miracles drew them after him. Jesus on one occasion says, you did not come to see me, but you came to see the miracles I performed. It's one thing to be drawn after him, it's another thing to be drawn to him, to him, to him. Jesus in this fifth verse simply gives us a picture of the great need in this story. The need was great. Verses 5 and 6, the question comes, what shall we do? What shall we do? Jesus says what he says in this passage to test Philip. Again, Jesus always knows what he's going to do. Jesus was not upset that there were 5,000 people that he was going to have to feed. Uh, he just wanted them to work through this process. But more than this, and I want you to write this down if you're taking notes, he wanted them above everything else to just trust him. To just trust him. Why, Lord, there's a little boy here. He's got five barley loaves and two fish. But what is that in light of this great need? What is that in light of this great need? Jesus moves in this passage and he tests our faith. Look in verse 9. He tests our faith. What is your feebleness this morning in comparison to the power of Jesus in your life? I'm reminded of Paul's writings in the book of Philippians. 
I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And my God shall supply all of your need according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Jesus was testing them. Will you trust me? Will you trust? They didn't have time to go to the market and round up all that food. <laughs> it was time for a miracle. And Jesus is testing them. What is our feebleness, again I ask you, in comparison to his power? What is your emptiness as a child of God or your emptiness as a non-Christian? What is that in comparison to his fullness? What is the many of your needs when Jesus is here? What is your many? Some of you have many needs this morning. I'm asking you, what is your many needs in light of the fact that Jesus is here? They were saying, Lord, what are we going to do? Boy, we're in a mess. We can't feed these people. This little boy has five loaves of bread and two small fish. What are they in the light of the great need? Jesus is saying, would you not trust me? Would you not trust me? Don't look at God through your problems. Look at your problems through God. Don't look at your problems through your problems to God. But look at your problems through God. There's a vast difference there. What would happen if you and I, in the midst of our difficulty, would just begin to look at our difficulty through the eyes of God. Five loaves, two fish, what are they in such a great need? What about Jesus? What about the miracle working power of God? They concentrated on the great crisis. America is in a great crisis this morning. Folks, I, I tell you, I want to warn you, we need to wake up. We need to open our eyes and not look to God through our problems, but look through our problems with the eyes of God. God is our only hope. God is our only hope. I'm so grateful we have the privilege to do what we're doing right now. I'm so thankful to God. On every hand. Now they're talking about saying that they can't, our children can't sing Christmas carols in school. <laughs> you can't mention the name Jesus in public. I want to say to all of these, all of these naysayers, I'm going to mention the name of Jesus until I draw my dying breath. I'm going to mention his name and I'm going to exalt his name and I'm going to support his name and I'm going to believe in his name and I'm going to live in his name no matter what they say. Amen. And no one can take that from me. No one can take that from me. Our government may demand what she demands, but I've got news. We are the government. <laughs> Amen. Government of the people, by the people, and for the people through the eyes of God through the eyes of God. Don't look at God through your problems. You'll have a cloudy vision. But look at your problems through the eyes of God. I wanted to repeat that because it's so important. It's so important. All of us can get discouraged if we look at all the things that are wrong around us. I know of a fellow right now who is just so upset, so upset about things. I'm upset about things. But I'm praying, God, would you help me to see what's going on through your eyes and not try to look at you through my problems. <laughs> if I concentrate on my problems, I'll never see what God sees. I'll never experience what he wants me to experience. And Jesus is saying to Philip, Philip, I've said all of this to really test where you're at. <laughs> uh, Philip, don't worry about the little boy. Peter, don't worry about the little boy with the five barley loaves and two fishes. I can do something with that. I can do something with that. The next point I want to make, is if we look at verse 10, little is much if God is in it. Verse 10, you'll find Jesus takes absolute control of the situation. 
But he only did that when they allowed him to do that. I want to say something to you this morning. Whatever situation you find yourself in right now, God wants to step in and take charge. But you've got to give it to him. You've got to give it to him. Amen? God takes charge. Why? Because God is a God of order here. And so Jesus gives a command and says, have them to sit down. Have them to sit down. Why does he do this? He's a God of order. Israel, I'll remind us, Israel came out of Egypt in ranks of five. Five is the number of grace. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that amazing? Look at all the devastation of Egypt. 430 years of bondage they endured. And yet out of this, God brought them out in ranks of five. I want to remind you of my grace, God is saying. Look at my grace. Look at my grace in light of your situation. I want to tell you something this morning. We must sit down if we're going to be fed. We must sit down if we're going to be fed. The psalmist said in Psalm 23, He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. I'm going to say this, and some's going to get offended, but that's all right. You'll get over it. <laughs> we need to shut off our cell phones. We need to shut down our computers and our laptops and our iPads, and we just need to sit down in green pastures and let God speak to us. We can't hear God because we're too busy to hear Him. We're too busy. I know, I know it's a, I scream sometimes, oh God, help us to learn how to get off of this, this endless cycle, this merry-go-round that doesn't seem to stop. Lead us into the green pastures. Lead us into the green pastures. It's a time of obedience. I want to so show you something here. Somewhere. These disciples had failed in their faith, but they had not failed in their obedience to God. Their faith was weak. They had failed in their faith, but they had not failed in their obedience. And Jesus said, tell them to sit down. Tell them to sit. Mark says in his account of this, of the feeding of the 5,000, he says literally, green pastures. Isn't that amazing? The psalmist says, he maketh me to lie down in green pastures. And this passage says there was a green section there. And it was a large section because it accommodated five men <laughs> sitting down on the green grass. 5,000, five the number of grace. Jesus next does something miraculous. Here is the beginning of the miracle, if you're taking notes. Jesus took the loaves and the fish, the two fish. He uses the small and the weak. Jesus uses the small and the weak. He will even use you. In 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4, you don't need to turn there. But in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4, he says, We fight not these battles with weapons of the flesh, but we fight them in the power and the strength of Almighty God. And we pull down strongholds in our life. How? Not by fighting the battle ourselves, not by fighting with our weapons, but with the weapons of the power of God. Jesus is saying, I want to take something that seems so insignificant, five loaves of bread, two small fish, and I'm going to do a miracle right in your very eyes. I want you to note something here. The loaves and the fishes had to be placed in the hands of Jesus before the miracle came. I find that quite significant. The loaves and the fishes had to be placed in the hands of Jesus. Whatever it is you've got in your hands, give it to Jesus. Give it to Jesus. It doesn't matter what it is. Great or small, bad or not so bad. Whatever it is that is holding you back, put it in the hands of Jesus. Put it in the hands of Jesus. The miracle begins to occur right here, if you're taking notes. Right here in verses 10 and 11, the miracle begins to occur. Jesus gives to the disciples 
and the disciples to the people. I want you to notice the, the movement of the miracle. The five barley loaves and two fish are now in the hands of Jesus. Jesus gives them the five loaves, the two fish, into the hands of the disciples, and they take those. At this point, there had to be some miracle <laughs> because there were 12 disciples. There were only five loaves and two fish. So the miracle is beginning to unfold before our very eyes this morning. And as they go, as they go, Jesus continues the miracle to 5,000 individuals. As they gave out of that basket, the basket multiplied. I've seen God do that, not with fish and loaves, but I've seen Him do it with money. And never will forget the second trip I made to Russia. We took, always took funds to bless the people in the church there, the needs. And so we gathered all our money, the team did, and we sat down and we counted it, every one of us. We counted it three times and verified it three times. It was put in a container and sealed. When we got to Russia, Pastor Dean, Dr. Dean called a meeting of the team and said, I want us to count the money. And we counted the money. And I stand before you and I can say to you unequivocally that that money tripled in its total amount. You say, Paul, come on, preacher. No, no, I don't need to come on. I saw it. I saw it. Nobody handled that. It was sealed in a container. And when we opened it up and counted it, we counted it again three times, and the amount had tripled. Our God is an awesome God. Amen. Our God is an awesome God. I want you to notice something here. The supply stopped only with the demand. The supply of God stopped only with the demand. In 2 Kings chapter 4, in the widow saw, and they said, go and, and get another containers. And they said, there are none left. And so the oil stopped flowing. God will never cease granting until you stop asking. Have you stopped asking? Have you stopped asking? The supply stopped only with the demand. What is it that you need in your life? What is it that you long for more than anything else? I tell you this morning the authority of God's Word. The supply will only stop at the demand. God never ceases to grant until we stop asking. The Bible says when they were filled, filled with peace, filled with joy, filled with the Holy Spirit, Jesus said, I want you to take up the fragments that remain. I had a meal last night with a little boy. I think he's about nine or ten years of age. And his daddy said, tell, tell Uncle Henry uh, about the miracle we talked about. And he said, uh, it was a miracle of 5,000. And he began to preach a sermon just like I'm doing right there. He just listed everything in the order that it came. And he said, well, what happened at the end? He said, they took up 12 basketfuls. There were 12 disciples. It's awful quiet. Think, that, think of that through for just a moment. They fed 5,000 men. And Jesus said, let's don't lose anything. Take up the fragments that remain. And those fragments filled 12 basketfuls for the, each of the disciples' personal needs. Isn't God good? Isn't God good? And Jesus said that nothing will be lost. I want you to pick up the fragments of your life today, the fragments of your time, the fragments of your joys and your expectations. And I want to challenge you and charge you to place them in the hands of Jesus. He desires nothing lost. Nothing lost. Do you know that you are running out of time? 
You really are. You say, preacher, that's discouraging. No, that's reality. The day you were born, you began to die. But I've got good news for you. God sent His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. Can I get an amen this morning? God wants nothing lost. Nothing lost. Pick up the fragments of your life and place them in the hands of Jesus. And He will give an extra bonus miracle. And He fed the twelve with the fragments that were left. And it was enough for their needs. God is good. God is good. All the time. And all the time.